Good evening, everyone, and thank you again for joining us tonight for Lancaster History's final Regional History Colloquium for our spring season. We will be back in the fall. Our plan for now is to remain virtual for all of the 2021 lectures, but we very much uh, look forward to welcoming you back into the walls of Ryder Hall where we can all be together for uh, our 2022 series. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome, though virtually, uh, back to Lancaster history, one of our favorite lecturers, Greg Scott. Greg uh, is a, Gregory J. Scott, I'll give your full name, is a fellow of the American Institute of Architects. He's a partner emeritus at RLPS Architects. Greg is a columnist for LMP News, and he's twice been the recipient of the Smedley Award presented by the Historic Preservation Trust of Lancaster County. Greg previously presented about C. Emlyn Urban, architect at Lancaster History, in a pretty memorable 2018 sold out crowd and I believe that was the event, Greg, that led us to implement a reservation system because we were <laughs> digging chairs out of every office and every corner of this building to seat people. And I'm quite sure we must have broken a fire marshal rule. So I know ton we did. tonight, we don't have to run that risk. Um, so I hope everyone's comfortable and uh, can kick back and relax and enjoy uh, Greg Scott's presentation. And at the end, we'll be delighted to take your questions. I'll turn it over to Greg. Okay. Well, thank you, Robin, and good evening, everyone. Robin, I didn't realize that I was the grand finale for the spring series. That's a lot of pressure. Anyway, everyone, I'd like you to know that I'm broadcasting from North Duke Street and um, I have a live audience with me this evening. So it's not all virtual. My wife, Terry, is with me and her parents. So I, there's three of us. So it's the uh, a grand welcoming, well, four, including me. And um, also, I have a live audience outside on Duke Street, so we're known to have a lot of ambulances, fire trucks, and motorcycles whisking by through the evening. So I'll try to talk over that if it, if it occurs. So first of all, I guess the big question is, why Warner and why now? Well, actually, this started back in 2019 when I promised the Hamilton Club that I would find out the name of the architect that built the beautiful building that we revere in this city as the Hamilton Club. I didn't know what I was getting myself into when I volunteered to do it, but I'm sure glad I did because it has made an amazing story, which I'm really anxious to share with you this evening. I can also tell you that this would be a very short Zoom meeting if it wasn't for the help and assistance that I've been getting from Lancaster History, LNP newspapers, and Deborah Osh. Deb has been my research historian for several years, and I would literally be lost without her. I can also tell you that one thing that COVID did not shut down or outlaw was the use of shovels. And I have been really doing a lot of digging in the last year and a half, two years. And uh, it has been nothing but fun and joy to discover all the new information on this amazing architect, James Warner. I've broken this story down into three segments. Uh, we're going to first review his portfolio of work. I'm not gonna get into a lot of detail on the architecture and the styles of the buildings. My goal quite honestly is to overwhelm you with the amount of work that this young architect was able to produce in our city in a short 11 years. Uh, then I'm gonna to move to the pilgrimage. How did he get to Lancaster? Why did he come to Lancaster? And what was he like as a personality? And then the final chapter is the plummet. Something went really wrong in his tenure and his stay here in Lancaster City. And we'll be sharing that with you. So with regarding the portfolio, keep in mind that when Mr. Warner entered our city, he was only 24 years old and he was only in town four weeks, four weeks when he won the commission to design Central Market. Now I know, I'm sure everyone on this Zoom call has been the Central Market, is one of our most beloved and revered buildings in our city. And most people don't know much about the architect that the talented young architect that designed this Romanesque revival building in the year 1889. The other thing most people don't understand or realize is that his name is actually inscribed on the wall, the east wall of Central Market. And it's part of the date stone. And to my knowledge, it is the only building in the city of Lancaster 
that bears the name of the architect. How in the world did he pull that off? So that's inf interesting information. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more in detail later on about the central market. So in the year, literally several months after he received the commission for central market, he was retained by Catherine Long. Catherine Long was the only child and daughter of Henry Long, well-established business person and judge in our community. And Catherine at the time was 42 years old and uh, she inherited his wealth when he passed away. And she quickly retained this young, brilliant architect And I can tell you, just looking at this slide, is a very complicated massing of building materials and, and details on that building. Within that same year, the St. John's Lutheran Congregation retained this young 25-year-old architect to design them a brand new church on, on West Orange Street. And he uh, convinced them to hire him and also designed it in English Gothic. He used Avondale stone for the exterior material. Believe it or not, at that time, the, the church cost a mere $30,000. He described it in a newspaper article as geometrical Gothic based on the 13th century architecture. It has a 95 foot tower and it seats over 700 people in a concentric seating pattern, which was a little bit unusual, unusual at the time. Now, what I wanna do is quickly put this whole business of the age of an architect in context. Warner was 25 years old. I'm gonna show you on the next slide what I was doing architecturally when I was 25 years old. I was. Uh, chief cook, bottle washer, and designer of Lee's Hoagie House in Quakertown, Pennsylvania. And unfortunately, it still stands there on Route 309. So if you're interested in seeing a Greg Scott original at my age of 25, help yourself. I've named the style Neo Crapola. I also recently discovered that one of my other 25-year projects was the uh, Alad's Tattoo Parlor located on Main Street in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. So you can see a dramatic contrast between St. John's Church and what Greg Scott was doing at the same age. Now also in the same year, 1890, the school district of Lancaster hired this young out of town architect. They awarded him with two commissions simultaneously. They asked him to design the Duke Street School and they also asked him to design the South Mulberry Street School. He did them two different styles. He did the Mulberry one in early English domestic Gothic. Both of the schools have innovation built into them. He provided a 70 foot tall ventilation stack on each of the schools to provide fresh air into the classrooms. Very innovative at the time. And he rolled it out for the school district of Lancaster. What surprises me is keep in mind that swirling around in the same city at the same time was our, our beloved C.M. and Urban and how he was able to obtain commissions of this magnitude with only being a resident literally months is beyond my ability to understand even now. Also in that same year, 1890, he was retained by George Steinman. George Steinman purchased this beautiful mansion at 32 South Prince Street from George Reed. It's an 1854 mansion. It's the largest one on South Prince Street. And Mr. Steinman of the Steinman Hardware Store retained this young British architect to design, uh, redesign the mansion for him. Also in that same year, 1890, Lancaster's Country Club retained James Warner to design them a brand new, beautiful country clubhouse and it still sits there today, representing a shingle style of architecture. A year later in 1891, Christ Lutheran Church, located at West King and Strawberry Street, uh, hired this young architect at the age of 26 to design a brand new church for them. And he did it in Gothic revival style with a beautiful 
Tower. Also in that same year, 1891, remember he's only 26 years old, Millersville Normal School at the time retained Mr. Warner to design three buildings all at the same time. The first one you're seeing on the slide is the beautiful library building in Romanesque Revival, inlaid with incredible detailing of terracotta tiles. The interior is beyond description. He introduced a serpentine balcony on the second floor. Very unusual for certainly for Lancaster County to have that kind of architecture in it. And then he also designed the Millersville Science Building in the same year, 1891. Look at the size. I believe this is probably the largest building that he designed in his portfolio. And then the third building that he designed for Millersville was their gymnasium. The last two buildings that I've shown you were raised or taken down in 1965. The library, of course, is still there. This is a recent photograph that Deb and I found that actually shows Mr. Warner's three buildings all in a row. You have the gymnasium on the left, the science building in the middle, and the library on the far right. An incredible portfolio of college work for a very young professional. In that same year, 1891, Franklin and Marshall hired Mr. Warner to design their gymnasium. And for Franklin and Marshall, he introduced English Country Tutor. And I'm sure you're all familiar with that building. It's right in our backyard. This next building just really surprises me that the Lancaster newspaper retained Mr. Warner to design the new era building for them on North, on North Queen Street. It's made with pressed brick and the announcement was made on June 6th, 1891 in the new era, declaring that uh, this young talented architect, James Warner would design their new office building for them in a Queen Anne style. In 1892, uh, the umbrella factory retained Mr. Warner to design a five story major massive addition to the original building, which is behind the one that you're looking at on the screen. Nevertheless, a huge accomplishment for him. Also in that same year, 1892, Henry Stackhouse Williamson, a dry goods merchant in the city of Lancaster, very well-known, well-respected merchant, retained this 27-year-old architect to design his mansion on the west end of town called Upland Lawn. This is the same Williamson that introduced us to Williamson Field and also Williamson Park down at the Lancaster County Park. Unfortunately, this beautiful mansion was raised in 1973. The carriage house, however, that he designed for Mr. Williamson still stands today and is something you really want to take a look at if you can. Again, keep in mind that this is a very young architect doing major incredible work for our community. Also in 1894, St. Mary's Roman Catholic Church retained Mr. Warner to design their beautiful rectory for them on West Vine Street. And just look at the incredible brickwork and corbeling detailing that he's introduced in that gable end and the tower. In that same year, 1894, one of the most energetic and prolific developers in our city named John W. Holman retained Mr. Warner to design his personal mansion for him at the intersection of West Chestnut Street and College Avenue. And Mr. Warner rolled out a Queen Anne shingle style mansion for him. Now it's a gorgeous mansion. It, the newspapers indicated in September of 1894 that Mr. Holman eclipsed himself with the Georgian marble used on his mansion. And it said that the design of his mansion is as unique as it is pleasing to look at. Quite an accolade for this young architect. But what surprises me even more than that is the knowledge that 
Mr. Holman retained C. Emlyn Urban two years earlier to design John Holman's row of six gorgeous row homes right next to his mansion that he hired Mr. Warner to design two years later. I can't even imagine the conversations that went on as to why Mr. Holman changed horses and switched architects when Mr. Urban did a magnificent job with the mansions that you see on the screen right now. So that's a little bit more investigation that needs to be done if we can do it. In that same year, 1894, Henry or Harry L. Shaw, Robb retained Mr. Warner to design his personal mansion on the west end of town. Mr. Robb is the Robb of Riley Brothers and Robb, the big hardware store on North Queen Street. So in 1894, Mr. Warner introduced Lancaster County's first Georgian revival example to our city and to our community. The mansion sits along Marietta. Please take a look at it if you haven't seen it. It's as beautiful today as it was in 1894. It's graced with a, a beautiful broad front porch facing um, Marietta Avenue. The next year, 1895, Mr. Warner was retained by Caleb Eugene Montgomery. He happened to be Mr. Warner's attorney. You're all familiar with this building, I'm sure. If anyone's going up or down Duke Street on foot or in an automobile, you will know this building as Visage Visage, designed by James H. Warner at the age of 30. 1895, the same year, the superintendent of Lancaster Cork Works retained this young architect to design his mansion on North Duke Street in a shingle style that's seen here. In, by the year 1894, the Shari Shemayim Synagogue had outgrown its quarters on the first uh, block or the 100 block of East Orange Street as shown here in this photograph, that's where the congregation met for many, many years until they outgrew it. And that congregation also retained Mr. Warner to design their beautiful new synagogue at the corner of James and Duke Street. I'm sure you're all familiar with this beautiful building with its twin towers, clad in copper, incredible brick rustication. Those are the stripes that you see in the walls. And the church or the synagogue is as beautiful inside as it is outside. Again, keep in mind, 30 years, I can tell you, is a young age for an architect to do anything close to the type of work he's doing. Everyone in our community is proud of our 1852 courthouse designed by Philadelphia architect Samuel Sloan. That courthouse went and served purposes for a long time until it also outgrew its quarters and needed an expansion. Well, interestingly, we discovered that the county commissioners retained Mr. Warner privately and without discussion and without introduction to other architects in our community to design the first major addition to our courthouse. It made headlines in 1896, when other architects in the community discovered that this commission was literally handed to Mr. Warner with no conversation. We also read a story where the reporters, newspaper reporters gathered around Mr. Urban following a rather contentious meeting and asked him for his opinion of the decision of the commissioners. And he said he declined to comment, thinking that it was okay. Hats off. But it's a beautiful building. I mean, it's very sympathetic to the original 1852 design. There's nothing wrong with it. But the mystery is, how did that happen without conversation? February 2nd, 1897, our Pennsylvania state capitol had a major fire in a sleet and ice storm that basically burned it to the ground. In that same year then, the state of Pennsylvania 
submitted and, and requested that architects from all over the country submit their designs to design a new capital for our state. At the end of the day, 30 architects from the United States, from Philadelphia, New York, Chicago, Washington, Baltimore, Los Angeles, 30 architects submitted their designs to the state in what we called a closed envelope submission. In other words, the architects submitted their drawings in a blind envelope so that the review committee had no idea who the architect was that submitted the design. It turns out that Mr. Warner was one of the people, the architects had submitted a design for our state capital, and he was simply known as design number 24. The jury had no idea who submitted design number 24. It happened to be our Mr. James H. Warner. Won the, won the commission hands down. Can you even imagine there were 29 piles sitting to the left and his sat on the right as the winning submission. That's pretty impressive. And he was only 32 years old. In 1898, uh, Mr. J. Nevin Schroeder retained Mr. Warner to design a triplet or a row home of three residences joined together on the 300 block of East Orange Street. I'm sure you're familiar with those. They are the beautiful Tuscany style row homes. It's the only style like that in our city. And they were designed by this architect who brushed into our town uh, and just basically gave us all kinds of pretty things to look at. It's just incredibly detailed. His ability to design and proportion, as you see on the screen, just defies imagination. Those of you who have driven through Akron have probably recognized this building on the screen. The borough of Akron retained Mr. Warner to design their school and town hall back in 1898. And he introduced English Renaissance to the borough of Akron and the newspapers declared it as quote, it was heralded as the most modern contribution to architecture of school buildings in Lancaster County. Here's the rendering that he actually presented uh, to the borough to win that commission. Next time you're in the town of Marietta, please go down the street and check out the Grove Presbyterian Chapel designed in 1898 by Mr. Warner at the age of 33. He again used that Avondale marble this chapel also has an 85 foot tall tower. He introduced Wilton velvet carpet in the church. It was the talk of the town and still is. This next client is one that again makes a whale of an interesting story. There was a very wealthy business family in our community at the time, uh, they, Mr. and Mrs. John Davidson. They were absolutely in love with the 1892 Richard Morris Hunt Marble Cottage. Yes, that image on the screen is called a cottage. If you live in Newport, Rhode Island, um, Mr. Richard Morris Hunt designed this for the Vanderbilt family in 1892. Well, the Lancaster family of Davidson's just loved this marble cottage. And they decided to hire this young British architect to design their own version of the marble cottage here in Lancaster. So the Davidson family took Mr. Warner on a train ride to Newport, Rhode Island, and they toured the cottage. And Mr. Warner came back and he introduced his version of the marble cottage here in Lancaster. It's located on North, on School Lane in the west end of town. I'm sure you've seen it if you've driven through that part of our community, but that is a pretty good representation of the, the marble cottage that we have up in Rhode Island here in Lancaster. It just mystifies me of the kinds of things this architect could do. There it is, our version here. And then the little side note I have to talk about 
is that the year before this cottage was designed or this house was designed, the Davidson family, the year before this, they retained our C. Emlyn Urban to design what you would call a retail warehouse for them on Chestnut Street. And then a year later, they dropped Mr. Urban and they retained Mr. Warner to do their personal mansion. I can only imagine the conversations that went on in the Urban household when that was revealed. Then the, um, the Borough of Columbia Masons retained Mr. Warner to design their Masonic Hall in, in Columbia. And it was designed over a five and 10 cent Woolworth store, as you can see here in this postcard rendering. There's not much left of it today, but it's, there's remnants of that that still sit there. He did that in Romanesque Revival. And then right up the river, the borough of Marietta retained him to design their school that you see here. That is still actually in Marietta. It's entombed by some additions and renovations, but the base building is still there. And then in 1901, this is the end of his career in our community. 1901, he was 36 years old. He was retained to design the Sacred Heart Chapel and Parochial School. That, of course, is still there. That's a current photograph of his late Romanesque revival style building on Nevin's, Walnut and Nevin. And the last building we have to show you in his portfolio is the Farmers National Bank that he designed in Lidditz, no longer there in an Italian Renaissance style. So all in all, Deb Osh and I have accounted for 62 major commissions that we can attribute to him in his short 10 to 11 year tenure in our community. He also introduced 12 architectural styles and these were different than the other styles that were common into our community, probably because of his background. When I looked up the definition of prodigy, I'd have to say, I think he pretty much fits the bill. A person, especially a young person, endowed with exceptional qualities or abilities. He certainly did that. So the question is, where did he come from? And how did he get here? And so forth and so on. Well, here's what we know. We know he was born on June 21st, 1865. He was educated in Kensington School of Design and Construction. We also know that he worked for a highly respected architectural firm in London at a, as a boy, according to a New Era newspaper article, as a boy. So he was born in 1865, June 8, 1885, at the age of 19, he crosses the Atlantic on the SS Germanic and he disembarks in New York City, June 8th. He's 19 years old. He came alone. There was no one with him, no siblings, no parents, no relatives. He ended up in New York City by himself. He quickly joined an international surveying team as soon as he arrived and he took off north with his surveying team and got involved in solving boundary disputes that were going on between the United States and Canada in 1885. He did that for one year. At the age of 20, he ends up in Harrisburg. We don't know exactly why, but he ends up in Harrisburg and he hooks his wagon to an architect in Harrisburg named, and this is not fictitious, John Smith. <laughs> John Smith happened to be from Manchester, England. And John Smith was 10 years his senior. So he was born in 1855. He immigrated to the United States in 1879, six years prior to Mr. Warner. So we don't exactly know how they met or how that connection came about, but they joined forces and quickly formed the business partnership of Smith and Warner. This is from a directory in Harrisburg. That's the printing that they used and they called themselves architects and superintendents. Unfortunately, we do not have a photograph of Mr. Warner, but from all descriptions and all accounts and everything that we can piece together, we bet he looked something like this portrait of Paul Wayland Bartlett. 
portrayed by Charles Pierce, a portrait artist. Interesting that the person depicted on the screen was born in exactly the same year as James H. Warner, 1865. So that's why I'm gonna hang my hat on. I think he's styled like him. He has that look, that appearance that I would imagine Mr. Warner would have had. Smith and Warner did some very interesting buildings in Harrisburg. This one still exists on the center city, nice parking garage behind it, but it's a beautiful Queen Anne that they did. Those two architects, Smith and Warner, did some very interesting buildings, including the telegraph building that you see here, quite innovative and quite out of the ordinary uh, for 1888. And it quite reminded me of Philip Johnson's AT&T building in New York City. So I wonder if Philip Johnson borrowed some of the ideas from their work in Harrisburg. Smith and, and Warner also did lots of churches and they were really known for doing complicated church forms, market buildings as well. This church is in Reading, Pennsylvania with a seating capacity of 1,500. That is a massive church for that period of time. Well, their marriage didn't last very long. They divorced essentially less than three years after working together, February of 1889, newspapers announced that they were, their partnership had ended. Concurrently, Mr. Warner ends up in Lancaster in February of 1889. So they quit their relationship and then he took residence in Lancaster City on King Street and that lasso shows and our records indicate that he rented a room or rooms on the second floor of this address on King Street from two spinsters who lived on the first floor. I believe and suspect that it was in this apartment on the second floor that he sketched his rendering that he submitted to city council of his view and vision for our central market. So this is directly from the submission that uh, was announced in our newspapers, March 30th, 1889, it was proclaimed that a decision was made to hire Mr. James Warner to design our central market, as it says in there, with very little discussion. And he has been located here only one month. They actually broadcast that he's been in our town four weeks and he wins the prize commission of all commissions. And keep in mind, C. Emlyn Urban submitted his design as well as John Evans. They were the prominent architects in our city at the time. So there's our, our central farmer's market. Deb and I were able to find the only surviving market in Harrisburg that Smith and Warner designed. And if you see the same similarity that I'll see, hmm, the Chestnut Street Farmer's Market's on the right, and the Lancaster's Farmer Market is on the left. I see some parallels and some similarities between the two. Okay, so they are similar. But why did he come to Lancaster? Well, we discovered a newspaper story in Harrisburg, and here is the headline of the newspaper story. Charles Brettlinger dead. And right under that, it says impending lawsuit the cause. With further digging, we find out that Mr. Brentinger had a nervous condition. And it said in the newspaper that he had an extremely nervous temperament. And that he was caught saying to his friends, I think rather than sit down in front of a jury and go to trial. I would rather kill myself. Well, it turns out that the lawsuit was brought against him from Mr. James H. Warner. So Mr. Warner was suing one of Harrisburg's most prominent business people. And the business person had a soft heart and could not even imagine himself going to trial and putting through that. So he killed himself the day of the trial. They found him dead the day of his trial. Wow. And then, then all of a sudden, Mr. Warner ends up in our fair city here. So it's interesting to uh, trying to understand Mr. Warner's personality. Uh, I call this one cashing in on the prize. Uh, he made very quick headway 
with winning this prize commission of doing our central market. And when you look at the, uh, the directories, the business directories at the time, you'll note that there are only four architects in the city of Lancaster. You see Evans, Evans, Urban, and Warner has the biggest type and the biggest print of the architects listed. And he also says, see advertisement on page 532. Well, look what the advertisement is. <laughs> it's Central Market with his name and embezzled on the very top. I can only imagine what it was like back then. I could just see these architects getting together downtown and just putting their the dukes up. The, uh, it had to be incredibly contentious, interesting. Also in reading the newspaper stories, we realized that a lot of adjectives were used to describe this young Warner, the architect from social climber to being brash, to being brazen and brilliant. You can see all these descriptors that we found in newspaper stories about him. So he was always in the newspaper. He would show up in the society's joys. Um, as you can see here, the, he was always in the newspaper, always making the headlines throughout his activities. Now, one thing that's always interesting to me, to me as an architect is what is the discipline behind the architect? We're known for our printing, our skill, our precision, and so forth. And on the left is an architect's alphabet, probably familiar with that look because they always say, oh, you print like an architect. Well, we only have really one set of drawings in our knowledge of what Mr. Warner's printing looked like. <laughs> and you can see it's a little free form, maybe almost a little cartoony. Uh, he does not do the same discipline that we see typically in architecture. It's more of script and writing, more of an artist, I would say, than an architect. He didn't have the discipline. The next slide I show you is a drawing that Mr. Urban did. Look at the refinement, the precision, the clarity of his drawings. So now we're gonna move into what we call the plummet. What happened? How did this all come apart in a short 10, 11 years to a person that had that portfolio that we looked at in the beginning of our program? Well, first of all, it turns out that there were just a slew of lawsuits going on in, in his life. Now, believe it or not, the first lawsuit had to do with the farmer's market, the market that he designed, his first commission. He ended up suing <laughs> the market commissioners for at the time what was $84.50, as you can see here. Now today, that $84.50 would be worth 2,400. So it wasn't insignificant, but it was over dispute of some additional services and the market master's committee couldn't see their way to paying him, didn't think it was justified. So he turned around and he sued them. Remember all those commissions he won in Millersville? Well, the, eventually the board of trustees and board of directors kicked him off the job for fighting, physically fighting with the general contractor for those projects. I mean, literally fighting him with fist up on the job site. So Millersville ended up hiring A.P. Welsh from Philadelphia, and they ended up completing those three commissions with the general contract and the Philadelphia architect. Well, remember the, the beautiful state capital? Well, that went haywire too. It turns out that, that they, of course, the newspapers announced, as you can see in this slide, that the architect, James H. Warner, was August 7th. They declared that James H. Warner of Lancaster was selected by the governor to draw up the plans, no less than the governor to draw up the plans for this beautiful building. That's August 7th. You turn around. I got a little bit of lag here. There we go. You turn around and literally within a few days, it says that Almost as soon as the fact became known that Mr. Warner was the architect, the political wires began and they pulled him, they pulled the job from him and they awarded the design to a Philadelphia architect. So what does Mr. What does Mr. Warner do? He turns around and he sues the state. 
he provides an injunction against the Capitol Commission, including the governor, and sues them for taking the commission away from him. Remember this job? Well, that didn't go well either. He ended up suing the Lancaster County commissioners because they refused to pay him his $2,000 of services that he said that he was owed. As you can see here, now that $2,000 would be worth $68,000 today. So it wasn't insignificant, but nevertheless, you don't make a lot of friends when you start suing everybody. And then he was always in the news. Um, he was, at one point, he was thrown out of a carriage on King Street, thrown up against the wall. That made the newspaper. He got into a boxing match in front of Watt and Shan department store with a business person downtown, John Arnold, and they put their fists up. There were 50 people around them cheering, gathering all this info. I mean, it was awful. Then the police came, broke them up, and then Arnold and Warner went up the alley and finished the fight in on Christian Street. <laughs> uh, you, can't, you can't even make this stuff up. And then like the next two days later, Warner turns around and he sues Mr. Arnold for $10,000 for liable because he said something ugly about Mr. Warner. So he sued him for $10,000 and that today would be a lawsuit of over $286,000 lawsuit that he brought against Mr. Arnold. And then this one is interesting. Then he goes and he sues a livery guy. guy. He hired a guy to look after his horse and his wagon and his riding equipment. He turns around and he sues him for stealing his riding gloves. They were $22 pair of gloves. And he accuses this gentleman of stealing his gloves. And now today they would be worth $690. So I mean, if, what architect would be sporting gloves, $690. He was arrested for trespass. He went trout fishing on someone else's property <laughs> and made the newspapers. He was in Lime Street doing some sketching. And apparently, according to the newspaper article, he dropped something on the ground. As he bent over to pick it up, his vest caught on fire because there were apparently matches in his vest and the friction of the matches ignited the matches and he stood up and his vest was ablaze. The women around him were shrieking and carrying on that this poor guy was on fire. And then I think the last one we have is this, this one really takes the cake just to show you how he just always wants to be on top and always winning. He, uh, there's a newspaper story in Harrisburg where he had a bet with someone, they were having a dispute, Mr. Peter Hughes, and he had a dispute, and they were gonna win the bet by each jumping in boats and paddling down the Susquehanna River, and whoever got to the second bridge first won. Well, during the race, Mr. Warner's boat capsized. He fell out into the river. That was not enough to deter him. He started swimming freestyle and ended up beating Mr. Hughes to the bridge and said, hey, it didn't say I couldn't do it in the water. So his demise really started falling apart pretty quickly, as you can see. There were a lot of things in the background. And I said, 1901 is the last time we saw him in Lancaster County. And it was in 1901 when he submitted a design for the long home, which we all know here in Lancaster and the state capitol I mentioned, he lost both of those commissions. And all of a sudden he disappeared and Deb Osh and I, could find no trace of him anywhere in any newspapers, anywhere. And all of a sudden in 1905, he shows up in the Washington DC newspapers. And so he shows up in Washington DC and he did some interesting work, but most of it were additions, renovations. He did a few churches. The most beautiful church he did was the Eckington Presbyterian Church, a magnificent church that he did unfortunately not there any longer in 1905. But his career really petered out pretty quickly at the end. But the church was five star, just beautiful. We do have record of his certificate of death. He died on October 10th, 1913. At, unfortunately, the 
at the young age of 47, he spent 17 days in the George Washington University Hospital and he died from what they, they declared as a cerebral hemorrhage, mm -hmm. but it was also alcoholic neuropathy. So he basically died from alcoholism and all the related um, issues that go with it. He also died uh, with no money. And the, uh, the, the caretaker, I should say the, yeah, the caretaker basically bought and paid for his plot and his headstone. He had no family. He had no one to be there with him. He died alone. He died with nothing. Uh, but this stone that you see there. So Mr. Warner rests in peace somewhere in this cemetery, the Congressional Cemetery uh, in Washington, DC. I've not had an opportunity to go look for it, but it's certainly on my list of things to do. So it is now currently 7.46 PM. Robin, I think we did pretty well on our time. I raced through it, but we wanted to leave time for some questions and answers and further discussion. Wow. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you so much, Greg. That was amazing. I, I said out loud, I think I exclaimed, wow, over here in my, my silent office multiple times. I very much enjoyed hearing some giggling here in this last section from your in-laws. So we're going to put them on the front row of all of our next lecture series. Um, did you have any idea he was such a character when you started your research? No, I had no idea. I mean, I like like everyone else, you know, I had seen his inscription on Central Market, James H. Warner. I mean, that drew really nothing. It didn't mean anything to me. I think it was really when Deb found that newspaper story that pegged him as the architect for Catherine Long's mansion. That's when the antennas went up. It's like, what's going on here? Because at that time, Robin, there was a lot of a lot of things swirling around. Well, it has to be a CM on Urban. I mean, that's the kind of work that he did because Urban did the Roslyn Mansion at West End of our city, and that's in Chateau S style. But we knew it wasn't Urban. We also knew it wasn't Frank Furness. We also knew it wasn't Patrick Welsh. We, did, we knew who it wasn't. We just didn't know who it was. Hmm. And when that happened, that just really set everything in motion. So we've long been aware of that powerful visual impact that C.M. Lynn Urban's designs had on Lancaster's built landscape. Would you characterize Warner's as more, less impactful? Oh, I'd say equally impactful, mm -hmm. equally, if not more. I think there's something about, there's a certain esprit de corps of Warner's work. The, you could tell it was fun. Just look at the only example we have is drawing you could tell that his mind was going a thousand miles an hour. He was interested in getting information, getting his ideas down on paper as fast as he could. He wasn't concerned about neat as he was concerned about doing it right, getting it beautiful. I mean, he was a master Robin. When I compare him to other architects of the time and his ability to move between 12 different styles beautifully and do them with such ease is just, and at the same time, Robin, obviously having some issues underneath all of that mm -hmm. as indicated by the accounts that we have. So which of the two do you consider to be more prolific? Which of the two architects had the most commissions that you're aware of? Well, more commissions. C. Emlyn Urban had over 450 commissions. Oh. Okay. So when you look at, you do the math, we know at least at this point that Warner had at least 65. We're still getting more that we know, you do the math, he did 65 in 10 years, 11 years, do the math. And he did a lot of, he could have done a lot of commissions mm -hmm. if he had done a full tenure. Mr. Urban practiced for 50 years. Mm -hmm. That's a long time for a practice. It is a long time. Um, one of our participants tonight was asking if James Warner worked alone, and you said a little bit about one of his early collaborations, but were most of his designs done in, um, as, independently? Was that normal for the time period or were there more architectural firms like there are today? Okay, he, as far as I, he did not collaborate with other architects. Counter that with Mr. Urban. Mr. Urban did collaborate with other architects. Sometimes I think because he was asked to, I know some of his church commissions, he would collaborate with Philadelphia architects on certain churches. To my knowledge, Mr. Warner collaborated with no one. 
I've not been able to find out how many he had on his payroll. A little interesting irony, Robin, is that we did find out that his office was actually in a building that Mr. Urban designed at 45 North Duke Street. Wow. So he was practicing in a building that his competitor designed. I find that quite humorous. Maybe that lit the fire under him. Keep getting I don't know, but he, he didn't need many matches to light fires. Um, ben Weber asks a good question about whether it's possible that Warner worked for Henry Williamson since he owned a store in Harrisburg. Could he have possibly been advanced here by the very wealthy businessman in Lancaster? That, that could very well be the case. Uh, I've always purported that, you know, at the end of the day, our business practice of architecture is not about the buildings. It's about the relationships. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Urban got so many of his commissions through his relationships. And Mr. Warner had relationships, too. I imagine he was as charming as a day is long. Mm -hmm. I have no doubt that he was this incredibly charming, energetic, attractive person that, that had this magnetism to him that, that just won him these commissions left and right and significant commissions. Uh, Mary McClure asked us how you think he could get that much work done so quickly. There's so much more to draw than drawing in these building plans. How, how was he able to do this so fast? Well, my recipe for me anyway was lots of chocolate, Coca-Cola, and coffee. I don't know what he did. I, and we, Deb and I have not been able to find out much information about the size of his office. Hmm. We've not been able to find out the size of Mr. Urban's office either, but we do have a newspaper accounting of at least two people in Werner's office. Now, it would take a lot more than two people to produce the amount of work that he did and the scale of that work. So that's the mystery that we have to work on. Hmm. Would you say, can you point out a couple of the key distinctions that you could make between Warner's work and Urban's work? We have a lot of Urban Warner interest tonight. Um, let me think here. Well, they both did lots of mansions. They have that in common. They work for very wealthy people. Um, I would say Mr. Urban was much more interested in the classics. When I say the classics, that's the more traditional styles of architecture at that time. For instance, the Watt and Shan building is a Beaux-Arts style of architecture. The Hager building is a Renaissance Beaux-Arts combination. So the classics have that more discipline, that old world look to them, where we're seeing as evidenced here that that Mr. Warner certainly liked Romanesque revival as a style. I don't know of too much Beaux-Arts style in Warner's portfolio. So there is a clear distinction between the two. He liked, Warner liked tinkering with Georgian or colonial revival as did Urban. There are very common threads. That would be an interesting graph to actually chart the kind of comparisons and contrast between the buildings that they produced in that period of time. I, you know, we can track what Urban did between 1889 and 1901. That would be an interesting exercise. And I'll take that challenge. We, we will hold you to that challenge. Okay. That will, that'll be fun to see. We'll have you yeah. back for, for, you can do your next one in, in person. Since okay. We're very much looking forward to doing that. Um, one question was, are there more recently designed buildings that seem to be inspired by Warner's work? Recently designed, meaning how recent? Uh, let's say in the last 50 years, anything that you can pinpoint that was inspired or even just um, after he stopped doing his designs here, did his legacy continue on in anyone else's? Well, here's an interesting little side note, Robin. Um, this was a point of quite a bit of contention until Deb was able to uh, really put an end to the speculation. There was a lot of speculation um, that James Warner was the architect for the Lancaster Theological Seminary hmm. up on James Street out near Franklin and Marshall College. It is clearly a beautiful example of Romanesque revival. It fits the time period. There was uh, suspicion that, that it was James Warner. There's no architect's name inscribed on that building like Central Market, so the big mystery went on. But through the LNP newspaper research and newspaper research in Harrisburg, 
it was clearly discovered that Mr. Warner's partner, John C. Smith, was the architect for the theological seminary. And that seminary was built after Warner was here in Lancaster. Hmm. So Mr. Smith came back to Lancaster from Harrisburg and designed and superintended the theological seminary. So Mr. Warner had nothing to do with it. Wow. Could you say something, if you know it, about the materials that Warner is using? Do you know anything about where his tiles or the bricks or his wood came from? Mr. Warner's, I don't know. Uh, a lot of materials at the time, particularly the unique materials like the pressed bricks and iron spot bricks at the time, some of the buff bricks. When Urban was really in his element doing his classic revival Beaux-Arts, he was using buff colored brick. My understanding is that's not indigenous to our clay here in Lancaster. So that brick was always imported. Um, I do know that Urban in, went to Philadelphia to uh, check out and buy his terracotta tiles, which he used a lot of, in, particularly in his early work in the 1880s and 1890s. We have records of some of the places he visited in Philadelphia for his tile work. So I would imagine some of the exquisite tile work we saw on Warner's Millersville Library probably came from Philadelphia. That was a a regional close to your kind of arm's length location for that kind of material. Hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll do two more questions and then okay. wrap up. Do you know what kind of training Warner might have had in terms of structural design or engineering? No, I don't know what kind of training he had. The only the newspaper accounts we have is that he came from a family that was well versed and knowledgeable of engineering, it said and architecture. So he was introduced to it as a young boy is what it says, not a young man, but a boy. Hmm. So that tells me that he was probably involved in a family, you know, in dad's office or uncle's office in London, getting this exposure. The other interesting thing is Robin, we found a newspaper account that said when he was retained to do our central market at the age of 24, he was already a respected architect in the United States, get that, in the United States, for his ability to do interesting structural roof forms and shapes. Hmm. Now, isn't that fascinating? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what I know at this point. Uh, they had to have engineers do their work. Uh, I don't think he would have had the patience, quite honestly, to do the engineering. He, I think, introduced the vision, and then he had someone else hopefully execute it. Well, so one final question. Uh, do you know when the houses on West King Street were built and for whom? The houses on West King that I showed in the slide? I am not, I think so, yes. Yeah, they were designed for John Holman. John Holman okay. was a developer, a real estate developer in our community, Anal analogous to say John Meter or Edra Garris, the local names we see today. Um, so John Holman retained C. Emlyn Urban in the year 1892 to do these beautiful mansions on the 600 block of West Chestnut Street. So they were owned and commissioned by Holman. So they were built and John Holman, the developer, owned all six. They were then built and then the newspapers introduced them to the city of Lancaster and said, these are for sale. So then they were gobbled up, as you can imagine, really quickly because they were quite beautiful and quite well done. And they're all in different styles along the street. Hmm. So that's what surprised me is they were so well done. And then Mr. Holman turned around and hired Warner to do his personal mansion. It's one of those things that I just don't quite understand. It'd be fascinating to understand the dynamics between the two of them and all of the, the power players that they must yes. have intersected with. Now, Robin, when I do when I do my West Chestnut Street walking tours, mm -hmm. I point out to the attendees on those tours that we start there at that mansion in those row homes. Directly across from those six beautiful homes that Warner did are six homes that, I mean, the six homes that Urban did directly across the street staring at each other 
are six homes that Werner designed. So you have six of Urban's on one side, looking at six of Warner's on the other side, anchored by Holman's personal mansion. <laughs> It's, it's crazy. It's, it's amazing that the fist fight didn't occur between Urban uh, it probably did. and Warner. Yeah. Um, so, Greg, this has been amazing. And I'm glad you just mentioned your walking tour of West Chestnut Street. I'd love for you to just quickly give folks a, a shameless plug about the Greg Scott walking tours, because some of the most interesting architectural information anyone can get is on a walking tour with you. Can yeah, you just I say a bit about sure. it? I don't. I mean, I'm a retired but not tired architect by any stretch. And um, several years ago, I just, my interest and my passion for our city's architecture is just, I can't sometimes control it. Terry can tell you that. And I just want to let everybody know how cool our city is and how fortunate we are to have not only our city Robin, but have folks like you in our museum that hold people accountable for, for what we have and that we don't lose buildings over time like we have. So part of my spiel on walking tours is to show audiences what we have and what we've lost. So it's not, I don't want people to feel badly. I want them to feel good about how beautiful our city was and it still is. So I basically on call sort of people get a group together and they say, hey, can you do a walking tour? I'll say, sure, if it fits into my schedule and I can basically accommodate 24 people on a walking tour and I think I have four different spots in the city that we do center city, we do a church tour, we do um, the West End tour, North Duke Street tour. More come online as we learn more about historic buildings in our city, but it's a hoot. And we, we do uh, give everyone a handout and on the handout are historic photographs from your library, Robin, as you've been on the tours. Mm -hmm. And so on the tour, we compare photographs of the past to what we have today so the audience can really see changes or similarities of past present it's it's just a blast they, they are a blast and so i hope everyone someday gets a chance to be on one um, i think that your tours and your articles and your research has done more to help champion the architectural legacy of lancaster county than almost anything i can imagine and certainly anything that's current and contemporary so greg we have you to thank for that well, thanks, Robin. It keeps me fit. Yeah. <laughs> I got to get my four miles I, in every day. I do see Greg walking back and forth in front of my house a lot, so I can attest to this. Some people say um, I'm marching, but I'm not marching, I'm walking. You're walking. You're walking. I've only had to drop him off once at home because he was running late. So, <laughs> um, so Greg, thank you so much. We are, we are so grateful for your time and your attention to this amazing architect. I learned so much from you tonight, as I imagine everyone else did. And, and I, I want to thank the audience, too, for tuning in. It means a lot to me that, that you back are interested in our community and in our architecture. And my whole goal is to help. I, I think education should be fun. It should be entertaining. And you have to admit, you know, as entertaining as Mr. Warner was this evening, also a very sad, I think, a very sad commentary at the end of the day. But I think we all owe it to him to hold up his work high and to thank him for the contributions he made to our community in a very brief period that he had here. So thank you, everyone. Perfect note to end on, Greg. Thank you so much. I look forward to um, a walking tour someday that includes Alad's Tattoo Parlor and Lee's Hoagie Shop. Um, and until then, we'll Not look- doing the Hoagie Shop or the Tattoo Parlor, I guarantee All right. you. All right, but we'll look forward to your next uh, set of research. Okay. Uh, and in the meantime, um, for everybody who was on with us tonight, thank you so much for joining us by Zoom. Robin, the one last thing. Yeah. Everyone, keep your eyes on Thursday's newspaper. We're going to roll out the Edwardian architectural style. That's the, uh, the, this month's column is on Edwardian style. Very rare. We have some good examples in our community. Uh, one of them is by, not Mr. Warner, <laughs> it's by Mr. Urban. So well, that's this Thursday, design intervention, Edwardian style. Perfect. We'll be on the lookout for that. And if folks can also be on the lookout after we get off the Zoom tonight, you will get an email with a brief survey that you can take about future lecture topics. Also, Greg's talk, as Emily mentioned, will be available on your our YouTube channel. It probably takes us about 24, 48 hours. So look for that. 
share it with your friends. Um, and please check back on our website, LancasterHistory.org for future programs. We really look forward to hosting our fall series of the Regional History Colloquium, and then again, future programming when we can all be together in person. So thank you again for joining us and have a great night. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. Good night.